Okay, tonight is the uh, 22nd of August, uh, 2011, and this is the third night. Uh, we are speaking on the Sutta Nipata. Tonight we come to chapter 3, uh, Mahavaga, the great chapter, or the major chapter. Uh, uh, this is a uh, long chapter, so we won't be able to finish the whole chapter tonight. Uh, probably only go halfway. Uh. The first Sutta is Babaja Sutta going forth. Uh, this, this is not the words of the Buddha, la, just, just uh, somebody describing about the Buddha. I shall tell you about the renunciation, the manner in which the one with insight renounced the world, and the manner of his inquiry which led him to choose the life of renunciation. In a home, thought that man, a life is stifled, impurity is everywhere like dust. For the wanderer thought that man, there is space. He lives out in the open, in the air. He saw this was so and set off. He was now a wanderer. So he worked to purify his life. In everything he did and in everything he said, he avoided the unwholesome and the bad. And as he, the Buddha, the one full of noble characteristics, walked about in search of food, he came in time to Rajagaha in Magadha. The king, Bimbisara, stood in his palace and seeing the one possessing the noble characteristics, called out to his followers, Look carefully, friends. He is handsome, shapely and of beautiful complexion. His gait is pleasing, with his eyes cast at only a little distance. With downcast eyes, he is mindful and he does not seem to be from a low family. Send out the palace messengers to find out where he is going. So the king's men were sent out and they followed him inquiring, Where is the monk going? Where is he planning to stay? The beggar walked on from house to house, watching the sense doors, well restrained, alert and mindful. Soon his bowl was full. When his begging round was over, he set off for the hills and made his way towards Mount Pandava. The messengers now knew that he would stay there. Seeing that he was going to stay there, some sat down and watched, while another messenger went back to inform the king. Your Majesty, he said, the monk has settled down on the east side of Mount Pandava. He is sitting there in his mountain lair, like a lion or a tiger or a bull. Hearing the messenger's words, the warrior king had his special chariot prepared and then set off with the greatest haste to Mount Pandava. The king went as far as he could go by the chariot and then got off and walked up the mountain to the monk. He sat down beside him, exchanged greetings and respects, and then spoke thus, You are only a young man, sir, a lad in the prime of your life. You are handsome and shapely. You appear to be a prince of noble birth, adorning a splendid army, esteemed by a council of nobles. Enjoy wealth which I can bestow upon you. However, can you please tell me what family you are from? King came the answer. Not far from Himavat, the snow land, is a country called Kosala. The people of Kosala are rich and they are strong. They come from the rays of the sun and the family name is Sakya. That was the people I left when I walked away from the wish and the longing for pleasure. I have seen the miseries of pleasure. I have seen the security involved in renouncing them. So now I will go. I will go on into the struggle. This is to my mind delight. This is where my mind finds bliss. So this is not really a sutta. La. This is just uh, uh, somebody uh, describing uh, what he thought happened during the Buddha's meeting, the king Bimbisara. Sutta, the second sutta is Padana Sutta, striving. Uh, this must be the words of the Buddha. I was living on the bank of the Naranjara River, engaged in deep struggle, practicing meditation with all my strength in the effort to find freedom from bondage. Mara came up to me and started talking to me in words, appearing to be full of sympathy. You are so thin and pale, he said. Why, you are near to death. I'll bet a thousand to one you're going to die. There's only the slightest chance that you'll survive. My dear sir, do live. 
it's far better to live. You could accumulate merit if you stayed alive. You could lead the religious life, perform the offerings to the fire god. It's a sure way to get lots of merit. What's the point of all this exertion? The path of exertion and struggle is difficult, hard and strenuous and full of troubles. Uttering these verses, Mara stood right next to the Buddha. Then the Buddha told Mara, who was uttering such words, Why have you come here, evil one, you friend of negligence? I do not need the least merit you speak of, Mara. You should preach about merits to those who need them. I have confidence and energy and knowledge as well. So have I engaged myself in effort. Why do you inquire about my life? When the wind blows, even rivers and streams are dried up. So why shouldn't it dry up my blood while I am still, well, while I am deep in struggle? As the blood dries up, so too will bal and phlegm. The body may be wasting away, but the mind gets more and more settled. More and more do mindfulness, wisdom and concentration get established in me. While living in this manner, experiencing the extremes of sensation, my mind no longer aspires for sensuous delight, for sensuous pleasures. The foremost of your armies is that of desire. The second is called dislike. The third is hunger, thirst. And the fourth is craving. The fifth is the army of lethargy, laziness. And the sixth is fear. The seventh is doubt. And the eighth is obstinacy and restlessness. Then there are also material gain, praise, honor and fame obtained by wrongful means. One may also think highly of oneself and disparage others. These, Mara, are your forces, the attackers of the evil one. One less than a hero will not be victorious over them and attain happiness. Look, do you see this strand of munja grass I am wearing? I do not care for life. I would rather die in this conflict than be alive but defeated. There are monks and hermits who have drowned in defilements and never see that path which the well-conducted ones tread. I can see the troops all around me with Mara mounted on an elephant and I go forward into the struggle. Even though the whole world, inclusive of its gods, cannot beat that army of yours, I am going to destroy it with the power of wisdom, like an unfired clay pot with a stone. With discipline, thought, and firmly grounded mindfulness, I shall travel from country to country, training numerous disciples. Alert and energetic in the practice of my teaching, Contrary to your wish, they will attain that which, having attained, they will not come to grief. And Mara said, I followed the Blessed One for seven years, and I've watched every step he's made. And not once have I had access to him, who is completely enlightened and mindful. I remember once seeing a crow hovering above a lump of fat on the ground below. Ah, food, it thought. But the lump turned out to be a rock, hard and inedible. And the crew flew away, and the crow flew away disgusted. We have had enough. It's like that crow eating rock for us. We are going away. We are finished with Gotama. Mara was so upset by his failure that he dropped the loot he was carrying, and at the moment it fell to the ground, the evil minded Yaka disappeared. So Mara had been uh, trying to discourage the Buddha in his struggle, but I could not. Uh, determination is very important. Uh, if a person's determination is very strong. Uh, the Buddha said, uh, even devas cannot obstruct you. The next sutta is 3.3, uh, Subhasita Sutta. Uh, this is also found in Sangyutta Nikaya 8.5. Thus have I heard. Once when the Buddha was staying in the Jeta Grove near Savati, he said to his monks, Speech which has, which has four characteristics is speech well spoken, blameless and not censured by the wise, namely the speech of a monk who speaks only what is wholesome or well spoken and not what is unwholesome, who speaks only what is Dhamma and not what is non-Dhamma, who speaks only what is pleasant and not what is unpleasant, who speaks only what is true or truthful, and not what is untruthful. 
speech characterized by these four factors is well spoken, not ill spoken, blameless and not censured by the wise. That is what the master said. And having said this, he went on as teacher to say this. Wholesome speech, the saints say, is foremost. One should speak what is Dhamma and not what is non-Dhamma. And this is the second. One should speak what is pleasant, not what is unpleasant. And this is the third. One should speak what is true or truthful and not what is false. And this is the fourth. Then the monk called Vangisa got up from his seat and went up to the Buddha. He respectfully placed his robe over one shoulder and with his hands placed together, asked the master for permission to speak. Having obtained it, he spoke these appropriate words of praise. Let us use words that do not cause us pain. Let us use words that do not hurt each other. Those truly are wholesome words. Let us use pleasant speech, where the words make people glad. Not resorting to evil speech, let us use pleasant speech on others. The words of truth are immortal. This is an eternal nature. As the old saying goes, words of truth cannot die. And good people, they say, are well grounded in truth, the goal, and Dhamma. And the words which the Buddha speaks, words that lead to blowing out, putting an end to suffering, are the worthiest words. <clears throat> this uh, disciple of the Buddha, uh, Venerable Vangisa, is very good uh, uh, at speaking inspired words. Uh. When he feels inspired, uh, he can say uh, very nice words. Uh. Right at the moment, uh, it comes naturally. Uh. So in the uh, Sangyutta Nikaya, there's one whole uh, chapter on him, Vangisa. The next sutta is 3.4, Puralasa Sutta. It has another name uh, called Sundarika Bharadvaja Sutta. And it is also found in uh, Sangyutta Nikaya 7.9. But I think there it's a bit shorter. La. Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was staying in Kosala, on the bank of the river Sundarika. Nearby, a Brahmin called Sundarika Bharadvaja was busy performing sacred rituals and burning offerings on a fire. When the Brahmin had finished his rituals, he got up from his seat and looked around. Who shall I give the remains of my offerings to? He asked. Then not far away, he noticed the Buddha sitting under a tree, completely covered by his robe. So, with the offerings in one hand and the water jar in the other, the Brahmin walked over to the Buddha. As he heard the Brahmin's footsteps, the Buddha uncovered his head. Why, thought the Brahmin, this man's had his head shaved. He's nothing but a shaveling. And he thought of turning back. But then he thought, some of the Brahmins have also shaved their heads. I had better go and ask him what family he is from. Stop here for a moment, huh? These Brahmins, uh, uh, I don't know whether you have seen uh, this Hare Krishna and all that. Uh, although most of their head is shaved, uh, they have a little uh, hair at the back, uh, uh, like a pigtail like that. Uh. So when they saw the Buddha was completely shaven, uh, he knew that it was not a Brahmin. Uh. So he went up to the Buddha and said, What caste are you? Or what birth are you? And the Buddha made his answer to the Brahmin. I am not a Brahmin, nor am I a prince or a farmer or anything else. I have come to understand clearly how worldly people are born or how castes have come about. Now I wander through the world as a wise man, without possessions, with nothing. I wear a double robe, I have shaved off my hair, and I wander without a home, without the need to mix with people in this world, fully calmed. Your question about caste is irrelevant. But sir, said the Brahmin, when Brahmins meet, they always ask one another whether or not they are Brahmins. The Buddha said, if you can say that you are a Brahmin and that I am not, then I must remind you of Savitri's mantra of three lines and twenty-four letters. Hmm, this one I'm not sure what it's about. Then the Brahmin said, but why have wise men of all kinds whether religious, military or secular, always made so many offerings to the gods here in this world. And the Buddha said, 
if the person who receives the offering is at the moment of offering perfect in understanding, fulfilled and accomplished, then I would say the offering would will be successful. And he said, this offering will certainly be successful then. For here in front of me is just such a man, a man perfect in understanding. If I hadn't seen you or someone like you, then I would have given the cake to some other person. And the Buddha said, Since you are searching for something, Brahmin, come and ask about it. Perhaps you might find here an understanding that is clear, without anger or pain or desire, one that is calm. And the Brahmin said, Oh, Gautama, oh, Gautama I very much like making offerings and I am anxious to make more, but I do not understand them. Can you teach me and tell me what makes an offering effective? The Buddha said, Listen carefully then, Brahmin, and I will teach you about it. Do not ask about caste, but ask about conduct. Look at the flames of a fire. Where do they come from? From a piece of wood. In the same way, a wise man may come from a low caste. Through his firmness and moral restraint, he becomes noble. Stop here for a moment. What the Buddha means is any type of wood so can make a flame. Don't need a, a top class wood, nah? Nah, any type of wood, nah? whether it's a cheap wood or an expensive wood, nah? you'll make the same flame. Nah? This sense of truth quietens him. He learns self-control and living a life of good conduct. He comes to complete understanding. This is where offerings should be given when offerings are due. This is where the Brahmin, the man intent on positive action, gives offerings. There are wanderers who have given up homes and let sense pleasures go, who are practiced in restraint and whose movement is as straight as a shuttle. This is where the Brahmin, the man intent on positive action, gives offerings. Those are those who are free from passion and with well-composed faculties, who, like the moon that has got free from the grip of Rahu, this is where the Brahmin, the man intent on positive action, gives offerings. This last part about Rahu. Huh? Rahu is a huge uh, asura. Lah. So one day uh, he caught the moon god lah, and he wanted to eat the moon god, lah, kill the moon god. Lah. Uh, so the moon god called to the Buddha for help lah, and then he managed to get free. Lah. There is no clinging to anything for these world wanderers. They are always mindful and self-thoughts have been left behind. This is where the Brahmin, the man intent on positive action, gives offerings. <clears throat> the wandering conqueror who has let sense pleasures go has seen where birth and death end. In the fullness of extinguishing, he is cool like a lake. He is the one thus gone, Tathagata, and worthy of offerings. On a par with his equals, the even-minded, and beyond comparison with the uneven, the one thus gone has limitless understanding. Nothing in this world or anywhere can pollute him. The one thus gone is worthy of offerings. Pride and deceit do not exist. There is no trace of ignorance, of self-thoughts, of desire. Anger has been lost, and in the utter calm of full extinguishing the Brahmana has removed the taint of grief. The one that's gone is worthy of offerings. Resting places for the mind have gone. Grasping is no longer there at all. Clinging to nothing in this world or anywhere. The one that's gone is worthy of offerings. He has crossed the stream. The mind is composed. In the perfection of knowledge, he has realized the way things are. He is in his last body and the passions are burnt out. The one thus gone is worthy of offerings. The intoxication of being has been destroyed and eliminated, and so has abuse of speech. There is none of it. Liberated and fulfilled in every respect, the one thus gone is worthy of offerings. He has shaken off ties. He is not tied down in any way, and there is never any pride, even when he is amongst proud people. He has come to understand where suffering begins and how far it goes. The one thus gone is worthy of offerings. He seeks seclusion, not accepting desires, 
and untouched by opinions. No objects of sense are clung to, none whatsoever. The one thus gone is worthy of offerings. All ties of every description, thoroughly examined, are destroyed and eliminated. They have all gone. Calm in the freedom of extinguished attachment, he is the one thus gone and worthy of offerings. He sees the end of birth, the end of habit change. He has left completely the path of passion, pure, faultless, spotless, flawless. He is the one thus gone and worthy of offerings. He does not see himself in terms of the self, poised, upright, firm, and free from desire, harshness, and doubt. He is the one thus gone and worthy of offerings. There is nothing in him that can lead to bewilderment. Causes of ignorance are gone. There are none whatsoever. He perceives with insight all phenomena. He bears the last body. Full enlightenment is reached, ultimate and blissful, and purification of the person takes place. This is the one thus gone and is worthy of offerings. And the Brahmin said, I have met a being who is complete in understanding. May my offering therefore be true. With Brahma as my witness, I ask the Buddha to accept me. May the Buddha enjoy these offerings. And the Buddha said, Now Brahmin, I do not accept gifts earned by chanting. This is not the way with people of clear knowledge. Enlightened beings reject what is earned by chanting. And while truth exists, this will always be the practice of the Buddhas. You may attend upon a great sage who is perfect, who is passion-free, and who has calm anxiety with some other food and drink. That will be a field for the man intent on merit. And the Brahmin said, Very good, my lord, but I should like to know to whom people like me should offer gifts. Tell me in the light of your teaching whom I should look for when I am making sacrifices. And the Buddha said, Where there is no quarrel, where the mind is undisturbed, where there is freedom from lust, where lethargy is done away with, where passions are conquered, where birth and death are understood, here is a man of wisdom, the Muni or sage. When a person like this is present at an offering, we should welcome him and honor him with food and drink without any trace of a frown. This is how a gift will be effective. And the Buddha said, Buddha, you are worthy of a gift, unsurpassable field of merit, and a recipient of sacrifice. What is given to your reverence is of immense fruit. Then Sundarika Bharadvaja said, It is amazing, Venerable Gautama. It is wonderful, Venerable Gautama. It is as if one might raise what has been overturned, or reveal what has been hidden, or point out the way to him who has gone astray, or hold out a lamb in the dark, so that those who have eyes may see objects. So likewise has the truth been explained by the Venerable Gautama in various ways. Therefore, I take refuge in him, his Dhamma and his Sangha. I wish to enter the homeless life and to receive the higher ordination near the Venerable Gautama. Then Sundarik, Sundarika Bharadvaja received ordination as a novice and received the higher ordination near the Buddha. Later, by leading a secluded life, diligently, energetically, and with a resolute will, in a short time he understood, experienced, and attained that highest perfection of a noble life, for which the sons of good families leave the household life harmoniously and take to the life of homelessness. Rebirth has been ended. A noble life has been led. What was to be done has been done. And there, is, and there was nothing else to be done in this earthly existence. Sundarika Bharadvaja had become one of the Arahans. So this man, initially, was only interested in making merit, uh, making sacrifices to heaven and all that too, and to the holy men uh, to get married. Uh, but after he was impressed by the Buddha, he decided to become a monk, uh, go forth. No, when a person goes forth, uh, he's no more interested in merit. 3.5 Maga Sutta. Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was staying on Mount Vulture's Peak near Rajagaha. One day a young man, a Brahmin called Maga, 
came to see the master. They greeted each other in the usual way, and the young man sat down by the side of the Buddha. Gotama, sir, he said, I am a lay sponsor. I make donations, give financial support, presents, gifts, and such like. I am an, I am an approachable person and quite open to requests. The wealth I give away, I have made quite lawfully, and I distribute these lawful profits to one or two people, or sometimes to twenty or thirty people, or sometimes to a hundred or more. What I would like to know, sir, is whether it's worthwhile making all these gifts and offerings. Could you tell me if they produce merit for me? And the Buddha said, Young man, all these gifts and offerings you make are certainly worthwhile, and they do produce great merit. It is the same for any man who makes donations and gives support, who stays approachable and open to requests, and who shares his lawful profits amongst one or two, or twenty or thirty, or a hundred people or more. All these gifts will bring great merit to him. Then the young Brahmin asked another question, and this time he spoke in verse. Gotama, sir, he said, you are a yellow robe wanderer a man without a home. You are a man who knows meaningful speech. Could you please answer this question for me? If a layman who is a charitable person, one from whom a gift may be expected, makes an offering, desiring merit by giving food and drink to others, then offering to whom will his offering be pure? And the Buddha said, If this charitable layman is going to make an offering or donate food and drink, and if he needs and wants to make merit, then to make the offering successful, he must give it to someone who can receive a sacrifice. He must give it to someone who is gift-worthy. Then the Brahmin asked the Buddha to tell him who these people were who could receive a sacrifice from charitable and well-intentioned laymen. Which people, asked the Brahmin, are gift-worthy? And the Master replied, there are people who wander around in this world without attachments, possessions, with nothing. They are whole and complete, and they have control of the self. When the time comes for giving, these are the people to give to. These are the people whom the well-intentioned Brahmin should give to. Those who have cut off the fetters and bonds, who are tamed, free, passionless and desireless. Those who are freed from all fetters, have tamed the wild and become free, free from the rage of passion and from desire. Getting rid of lust, hatred and delusion, they have eradicated defilements and have perfected the religious life. There are people with no room for trickery or pride. They have no greed, no thoughts of I, no desire. They have gone across the ocean, for they did not fall prey to the thirst of craving and so now they can live and move around without thoughts of I. They do not have longings or yearnings for anything in the world. They have no longing to be something in this world, and no longing to be in any other world. They have given up pleasure that is sense-based, and they have perfect and fine self-control. They walk from one place to another without homes to return to, and they move with directness like a shuttle pulling thread through a loom. They are free from lust. Their senses are well composed. They are free, slip loose, like the moon easing free from the teeth of Rahu. They are quietened and calm, with no passions or anger. They are not going anywhere in this world. Once they die, they have given up rebirth. They have given up birth and death with no remainder, and they have gone beyond all doubt and uncertainty. They are islands unto themselves. They have nothing. They go from place to place, and in every way they are free. They know precisely what this sentence means. There will not be a rebirth, no more becoming. This is my last existence. In the enjoyment of meditation, in the fullness of knowledge, and in the strength of mindfulness, a person has full enlightenment and is a shelter for many. When the time comes for giving gifts, this is the person to give to. This is the person whom the well-intentioned Brahmin gives to. Master, said Maga, my question has certainly brought full rewards for me. You have explained to me what give-worthy means, 
and who these people are, for you know it as it really is. You have seen this in accordance with fact. But tell me one thing, Master, when a charitable and well-intentioned layman makes an offering or gives away food and drink, how should he do it to make the offering successful? And the Buddha said, Make your offering maga, as you make it be pleased in mind. Make your mind completely calm and contented. Focus and fill the offering mind with the giving. From this secure position, you can be free from ill will. If you have no rush of passions and can get rid of ill will, and if you develop the mind of boundless loving kindness with constant care and alertness night and day, then the loving kindness will spread infinitely in each direction. O Master, said Maga, tell me who can be pure, who can be free, who can be enlightened. How do you get to the Brahma world on your own? O Master of Wisdom, please tell me the answers. O Master, you yourself can witness that today I have seen Brahma, for you are the same as Brahma to us. It's true. O Master, shining light, please tell me how a man can get to the Brahma world. And the Buddha said, Maga, I will say this to you. When the third, when the third or the three of the three qualities of perfect giving is completed by giving to a gift worthy person, then Maga, the completed act of giving itself takes the giver, the man whose practice is giving, into the world of Brahma. Then Maga, the young Brahmin, spoke in praise of the Master. It's amazing, Venerable Gautama. It is wonderful, Venerable Gautama. Just as if one might raise what has been overturned, or reveal what has been hidden, or point out the way to him who has gone astray, or hold out a lamp in the dark, so that those who have eyes may see objects. So likewise has the truth been explained by Venerable Gautama in various ways. Therefore, I take refuge in him, his Dhamma and his Sangha. May the Venerable Gautama accept me as a lay follower who henceforth has taken refuge in him for the rest of his life. So he was pleased with the Buddha's explanation uh, how to make an uh, uh, offering uh, that will give a lot of merit. Uh.